Good morning. Happy fourth Sunday of Lent. This means that we are three weeks away from Easter Sunday, which is amazing. So with that in mind, um, I would like to remind the worship team that we're going to have a hopefully short meeting after worship today um, so that we can talk about Maundy Thursday services. Um, not a lot going on this upcoming week. It's pretty quiet. We do have a session meeting on Tuesday. Session elders, the packet is ready in your, in your uh, little cubby in the office. Those of you worshiping with us at home, we're so happy to have you with us as always. And if you would please extend a greeting in the comments field so that we know that you are with us. You bless us with your presence live and, well, not in person, but definitely live, and we want to know that you're with us. Are there any other announcements, uh, anything in the bulletin that needs to be emphasized? Or, oh, okay. Oh, yes, it is. Today at 2 o'clock is the last chance to see Annie at the high school. It's, I've heard it's a wonderful show. We're taking our family today at 2. So if you're free, come join us. It's going to be a great time. Right. Anything else? Okay. Nice and easy. Okay, I'm not turning it off. Let's prepare ourselves in that case body and mind and spirit to worship God this morning. Thank you. 
Please rise in body or spirit for the call to worship. God did not see as mortals see. We look at surfaces. God sees deep into the heart of things. Jesus, light of the world, give us eyes to see what you see. Though darkness may surround us, though sin may confound us, God calls the, ch the children of light what is good and right and true. Jesus, light of the world, give us eyes to see as you see. Now you guys got to wait. I got to talk. Uh, will the kids come forward, please? Easton's ready. Cora's ready. Ruby's ready. Calvin's ready. I think we've got Miles on the way. Let's all applaud when he gets here. Fantastic, guys. Good morning. I'm so glad to see all y'all. We are going to talk today about perception. Right. You know, yeah. So what <laughs> perception, that's a, that's a big fancy word. Anybody want to guess what perception means? No. Cora does not want to guess. Any guesses? Calvin, how about you? you? Do you have an opinion on this? No. No opinion. Okay. Oh, but Miles does. Great. <laughs> oh, no, you don't. <laughs> you were going to say something else. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, this one you go to and if you want. Well, how about we do that after worship and you can show me how your shirt works? Because I bet that's really cool. You've got lots of buttons. All right. Ruby, Easton, it comes down to you. What's perception? No, okay. All right. Oh, oh of course, changed her mind. All right, what do you think it is? I think perception means... Um, that you, I forgot. Okay. It means the way you see things. Oh, like it. Like the way, like it, the same word as perceive comes from perception. So we are going today, I've got some pictures for you, and we're going to talk about perception. So that one is yours. And Easton, let's give you this one. Oh boy, oh boy. You don't have to keep it forever, but you do have to keep it. Okay, and 
give you that one and Ruby, there's yours, and Young Miles, there's yours. Okay, starting with Cora, I would like you, and um, Roger, will you bring up the first of those? There we go. This is what Cora is looking at. Cora, describe that. What does that look like to you? What do you suppose that's a picture of? It looks like a snake with pointy scales, mm -hmm. and then flat scales, and then smooth scales, and then another flat scales with bumpies. Okay. I think, the, I think the operative word here is scales. And Cora, you're absolutely right, except it's not a snake scales. You want to know what kind of animal has those scales? Is uh, oh, tadpole? No. Nope. Oh, a viper. I'm sorry, not a viper. No. Um, is it? Uh, oh, Ruby's got a guess. Shall we? Shall we give Ruby a guess? What a do you think? Fish. A fish. That's a good guess, but nope. Oh, 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 oh. oh. A bird. A bird. It's not a bird. Uh, All right, one more. Oh, two more guesses. All right, you. Get, okay, Miles. Oh, 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 let's do Calvin, and then we'll do Miles. A butterfly. <gasps> Calvin, it is a butterfly. How is it a butterfly? Butterflies have tiny, tiny scales on their wings. It doesn't look and like it helps a butterfly them fly. at all. Exactly. Good job, Cal. I know. So this is why, because that, oh, yes, let us hear it for <laughs> Faith and Science meeting one side by side because that's really really magnified Cora oh. super magnified okay so since you guessed it right Cal you get to tell us what you think your picture is so do another one that's it that's it this is what Cal's looking at Calvin what do you suppose that is take a take a guess But don't overthink it, because we want to go home. Lily. What do you think? Lily. I think it's the moon. We're going to give... Cal, what do you think? Give it a guess. Is it kind of like the slime on the snail? Oh, interesting guess. The slime on a snail. Wait, a lizard? It's not a bad guess. A lizard? It's not a lizard. Not the slime on a snail. What do you think? Is it uh, part of the moon? Is it part of the moon? Not part of the moon, although it does kind of look like the moon and it kind of looks like slime. What do you think? Um, an egg for a bird. And a bird's egg. It does look like a bird's egg. These are great guesses. Easton, you want to guess on this one? Not this one. Okay. Oh, you do want to guess. Okay, what do you think? Snake. But this one is a snake. I'll tell you what this is, and you guys aren't even going to be able to believe it. It's the tip of a ballpoint pen. It's the tip of a pen. So think about a pen that people write with, and that is what the little ball at the end of it looks like. And what's on it is ink. I know, but you guys' guesses were terrific. Really, really, really good guesses. All right, let's do another one. Let's see. That, I think, is Miles's. Miles, what do you think that is? Give us, give us a guess. Don't overthink it. Grass on a field. It looks like grass on a field. Easton, what do you think that looks like? Do you, what does it look like? Flesh. Less? Lettuce. Oh, lettuce. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're hungry too, right? What do you think? Is it the top of carrots? Is it the top of carrots? Oh. Reasonable guess. What do you think, Cal? Is it celery? Is it celery? You guys are all making me hungry for a salad. All right, Ruby, have you got a guess about what this is? Bamboo. Oh, look at you guys. This is actually something each of you has at home, and I hope you used it this morning. This is what a toothbrush looks like up close. Now, I don't know why it's green. 
Let's hope that it has nothing to do with the dental hygiene of whoever this toothbrush belongs to. But that's what the little bristles of your toothbrush look like. All right, Easton. Let's take a look at your picture. I can't remember which one you have. I think this is the second one in that series, Roger. Yeah, that one. All right, what do you think? What do you think? Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. Oh, I like Brussels sprouts. Do you like Brussels sprouts? I know, I know. Oh, okay, Calvin says? Asparagus. Asparagus? Bamboo. Bamboo? Hey, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, I got another one, I got another one. Okay. Is it like rotten trees? That rotten just about, trees? That were just about to grow, but they're still green and they don't look good. But they're still green and they don't look good. It does look like that, doesn't it? Ruby, do you have, do you have anything else that, that this might be able to be? What do you think? Is it? You don't have to add anything. Nope. Okay. All right. Oh, Easton, you had a second Is one. Is it inside of a pumpkin? Is it inside a pumpkin? Interesting. These are all terrific guesses. Do you know what this is? I will is tell you. this oh. a muddy forest? Is this a muddy forest? It looks like a muddy forest on its side, doesn't it? Did you have another idea, Cal? Is it a plant? Is it a plant? It is not. Do you know what this is? A paper cut. Here. It is hair. hair. That is what your hair looks like, magnified about 100 billion times. Probably for the same reason that toothbrush was green. Yeah. It's just one of the mysteries. OK, we're going to bring it home with you, Ruby. This is the one that's the little cubes. There we go. What do you think that is? Ice cubes, it looks like ice cubes. Uh, is it salt? Is it salt? No. I salt know. water? I no. I know. What does it look like? Ice with salt. In ice it. with salt, okay. <laughs> Sugar. Sugar. Can you be more specific? Sugar on a plant. Sugar on a plant? Hey, Easton, do you want to give it a guess? It's a specific oh. kind of sugar. Sugar ice. Sugar ice. This is actually brown sugar. But when you magnify it this much, you can almost see through it. I know this is Anderson. So what did this teach us about perception, about the way we That's see things? Day. So when, why did these things all look different? Because they're not how we normally see them. Because they're not how we normally see them. And I know because the last we don't have microscopic vision, right? Yeah. I know what the last two are. Oh, well, we don't have time for the last two, but we can talk about those another time. It's All right, so here's the. I have a rock in my boot. You have a rock in your boot? This one. Well, that, I perceive that that yeah, is not any fun. All right, now that you guys are all wound up, here's, the, here's your take home. Sometimes we don't see things the way they really are because What's of our that? perception. What's that? It's a microphone. And so, what we need to remember is that God can see all of these things the way we see them and the way we see them through a microscope. So like one eye's the one we see. God can see the... from all the way in space all of these little things. Um, God sees things that we don't see, and so we need to remember when we're making a decision about something <laughs> that we, we need to think about how God sees things. All right, so, so like, we're going to pray now, my so friend. Like one eye is the way we see it, and the other eye is microscopic? Yeah, that's it. I don't know. Shall we pray? Yeah. Dear God. Dear yeah, God. Thank you for our eyes. Help us to see the way you see. Help us to see the way you see. Which is with great love. Which is with great love. And thank you for loving us. Amen. You can take your pictures if you want to. Oh, no, okay. We are ready.
As children of God's light, we are called to what pleases the Lord, to participate in what is good and right and true, and to expose what is unfruitful and evil. Knowing our inclination to turn away from God's light, we freely confess our sins. Let us pray. Gracious God, why is it we look but do not see? You promise to meet us where people are hungry, homeless, sick, and in trouble. But those are exactly the places we don't want to go and people we don't want to meet. Forgive us, loving God, as often as we stray, bring us back into your fold. As often as hide our eyes, bring us into the light. Lay your hand upon us and heal us so we are transformed. So we too may say, though I was blind, now I see. Amen. Friends, Psalm 23 tells us that God's goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life and that our place in God's house is assured forever. Believe the good news. Christ is the good shepherd. In him we are protected, guided, and forgiven. Thanks be to God. This is the time where we bless one another with the ancient Christian greeting that Jesus himself greeted his disciples with after his resurrection. And this is also where we say good morning and peace be with all of you who are joining us online. We've got Diane, we've got Monty, Kurt, uh, M, Fran, Karen, Pam, it's wonderful to have you all with us. And all y'all here today, be sure that you wave because they get to see all of us milling around while we're passing the peace in person. So my friends, as God has loved and forgiven all of us, let's practice love and forgiveness toward one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's share the peace of Christ.
Will you pray with me? Holy God, we ask you to open our eyes to see your truth revealed in Holy Scripture and faithful witness. Amen. Our first lesson takes us to ancient Israel in the early years of the monarchy. Saul has been king for a while and hasn't exactly ex distinguished himself. When God decides to depose Saul, Saul, God's prophet Samuel grieves deeply. Samuel is also keeping a low profile, knowing that anything God does from now on will favor Saul's successor, whom scripture does not name until Samuel anoints him king. Listen now for God's word from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long are you going to grieve over Saul? I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your flask with oil and get going. I'm sending you to, to Jesse of Bethlehem because I have found my next king among his sons. How can I do that, Samuel asked. When Saul hears I'm anointing another, someone else as king, he'll kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say, I'm here to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You will anoint for me the person that I point out to you. Samuel did what the Lord instructed. When he came to Bethlehem, the city elders came to meet him, shaking with fear. Do you come in peace, they asked. Yes, Samuel answered, I've come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Now purify yourselves, then come with me to the sacrifice. And Samuel sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice as well. When they arrived, Samuel looked at Eliab, oh, I said that wrong, Eliab, and thought, that must be the Lord's anointed right there in front. But the Lord said to Samuel, have no regard for his looks or height, because I haven't selected him. God doesn't look at things like humans do. Humans see only what is visible to the eyes, but the Lord sees into the heart. Next, Jesse called for Abinadab, who presented himself to Samuel. But he said, the Lord hasn't chosen this one either. So Jesse presented Shamnon. But Samuel said, no, the Lord hasn't chosen this one. Jesse presented seven of his sons to Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't picked any of these. Then Samuel asked Jesse, is this it? Are, there in, are these all of your boys? A little suspense. <laughs> there is still the youngest one, Jesse answered but he's out keeping the sheep. Send for him, Samuel told Jesse. We can't proceed until he gets here. So Jesse sent and brought the youngest in. He was suntanned, had beautiful eyes, and was good looking. The Lord said, that's the one, go anoint him. So Samuel took the flask of oil and anointed him right there in front of his brothers. The Lord's spirit came over David from that point forward. Then Samuel left and went to Ramah, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That was a lot of names, and you did awesome. <laughs> and I figure anybody who complains about Mispronounced biblical names is just using a really subtle, nuanced method of volunteering to read next week. This morning, I woke up with the alarm clock with Maximilian's behind, right here, right here. And Hezekiah was at my feet, and he was doing his happy little making biscuits thing, and I think he was happy because he was nowhere near Max's behind or my morning breath. It was just a very cozy, nice little domestic scene, the kind that makes good people grateful to God for their blessings. I, however, lay there staring at the ceiling and thought, as you do, I wonder what the deepest lake in the world is. <laughs> and now, thanks to these, you don't have to wait for an answer. So before I even got up, 
I knew. And this, my friends, is just one of many reasons why I will never be president. You will be relieved to hear that Maximilian was the only person mortally inconvenienced by me reaching over for the phone and looking this up. And the answer is this. The deepest lake in the world is Lake Baikal. I think that's how you spell it, or how you pronounce it. It's B-A-I-K-A-L. And it is in Siberia, southern Russia. If you put Lake Baikal on a map next to our Great Lakes, you've got the Great Lakes going on over, all over here, and Lake Baikal is this just long, skinny lake. Great Lakes, long, skinny Lake Baikal. But the Russians get the last laugh on this one. The Great Lakes combined, I'm doing all of this in bed for you guys this morning, guys. The Great Lakes combined have about 5.99 quadrillion gallons of water in them. That is a lot of commas and zeros. If you emptied out Lake Baikal, long skinny Lake Baikal, and poured all of the water from the Great Lakes, that 5.99 quadrillion gallons, into Lake Baikal, you would still have room left over for 250 trillion gallons of water. Not only is Lake Baikal the deepest lake in the world, it holds the most water, 22% of the world's fresh water is in that one lake, which if you look at it from space does not look nearly as impressive as our great, and I mean really great lakes. And that's what I wanted to share with you today. And that's pretty much it. Unfortunately, you guys pay me every Sunday for a 1,500-word sermon. And if today's sermon was our planet's fresh water supply, what I just said would be Lake Baikal. Do the math. The point made in our Old Testament reading that we just heard Ruth read is this. We, we tend to see very little past what we already assume to be true. And the same point is made in the ninth chapter of John's Gospel, which is a very long chapter that I encourage you to read sometime this Lenten season, not right now. Um, we're just going to read the first three, or first three, first seven verses from that chapter. Um, but the whole story about this guy who's healed by Jesus is a story about how very respected, deeply religious people rejected something genuinely marvelous and rejected the person the marvelous thing happened to because it contradicted what they believed to be true about Jesus himself. So we're just going to read the setup to that story in John 9. Uh, verses 1 through 7, continue to listen for God's word. So as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this guy born blind? Was he being punished for his own sins or his parents' sins? And Jesus answered, and I am paraphrasing here, why is it always about sin with you people? It has nothing to do with this guy's sins or his parents' sins. His blindness simply gives God's power a chance to be revealed in him. Come on, let's hurry up and do the job assigned to us by the one who sent us. Night is coming, and then no one can work, but while I'm here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then Jesus spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. And Jesus told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went, and he washed, and he came back, able to see. This is the word of the Lord. The Bible does not waste a lot of time telling us what people in the Bible looked like, but it conspicuously notes appearances in the stories about David. Um, and, and of Israel's early monarchy generally. King Saul, before he was anointed by Samuel as the first king of Israel, King Saul was described as a man who stood head and shoulders 
above other men. And this was not just figurative. He was apparently an unusually tall man. Samuel anointed Saul king, and Samuel loved Saul very much as a king and as a man, even though Saul wasn't very consistently good as a king. So when Samuel goes to anoint God's next king, David, he's still got Saul on the brain, and Saul is still weighing on his heart. And so when he sees Eliab, who, as far as I know, this is the only place where Eliab ever gets mentioned, this older brother of David's. As soon as Samuel sees Eliab, and he sees how tall this guy is, physically tall, he assumes that this must be God's guide, God's guy. And so I'm imagining what's going on maybe subconsciously for Samuel. So God's first king was unusually tall. This guy's unusually tall. Unusual tallness equals God's king. Or, probably more likely, what was coloring Samuel's impression of Eliab was this affection that he had for Saul and this hurt he was carrying in his heart because of the failure of that reign. The love that Samuel had for Saul was not, was not a sin. But again and again and again in Scripture, we see that God's prophets are called to see past their own biases. They're called to sort of wipe off their own lenses and try to see as God sees. And so it's a good thing in this little story that it wasn't just dependent on what Samuel was seeing. He's also obviously listening to what God is speaking to his spirit. What I think we have here is is what we moderns call confirmation bias. And confirmation bias, well, let me define it first. Confirmation bias is a preference for what we already know. And in our time of crazy making amounts of information coming at us all the time, Confirmation bias becomes something of a a mental defense mechanism. I mean, we've got to filter all of this stuff some way. And confirmation bias helps us to do some of that. But oh, how confirmation bias can limit our experience of life and our experiences of one another. So here's an example. In 2019... Jackie Shelton Green became North Carolina's first African-American poet laureate, and also only the third female poet laureate North Carolina had ever had. And so she gets this honor, and she and her husband immediately began touring North Carolina, and they're doing poetry readings, they're going to bookstores and libraries and college campuses all over the place, But it's also important to this particular poet laureate that she go to places where regular people just meet because her experience is that going into places where people actually live gives poetry itself an opportunity to be. And so she and her husband go to Biscuitville Has anybody ever heard of Biscuitville? I had never heard of this before. Apparently, it's a fast food chain in North Carolina and also Virginia, I believe. There are about 50 of them. And Biscuitville specializes in biscuits. Oh my gosh, you guys are on today. Yeah, they're they're absolutely famous for their their southern biscuits. Every year for the last several years, Biscuitville, the chain, has observed African American Heritage Month by choosing um, an African American person to honor, and then they put that person on a bookmark. So they did Toni Morrison, the author, one year. They did, um, what's her name, Rhiannon Rhiannon Giddens, a singer-songwriter who's pretty amazing, did her one year. And so in 2019, 
they featured North Carolina's first black poet laureate, Jackie Shelton Green. So there's this article in Yes Magazine that, that talks about this encounter. Green and her husband were in a lot of places in 2019 where they were the only, the only black people anywhere in sight because North Carolina, in many respects, is still very segregated. And so when Green received the award of being the Poet Laureate, she said that she wanted to use that honor to be an ambassador for all North Carolinians. And she wanted to meet them right where they were at. And so one day that meant doing a poetry reading over breakfast in the Biscuitville in Greensboro, North Carolina. And the place was apparently jam-packed, full of people. And among the people who showed up for biscuits and poetry that day were four white men, and all of them were wearing matching red hats with a political slogan on them. Now I want to pause here for a minute. And I want all of you to do a really quick gut check. Because if you felt some sort of twinge at the mention of that political symbol, I just want you to sit with that for a minute. Because that emotional response, good, bad, I suppose indifferent doesn't matter, but if you did have an emotional response, that emotional twinge has already begun to impact where you think this story is going. The emotional response will also influence the backstory that you have just written at the speed of light in your own mind about four guys having breakfast and wearing hats. Confirmation bias validates our perceptions and it short circuits our pursuit of truth. And sometimes the truth is astonishing and something that God would very, very much not want us to miss out on. So after the poetry reading, these four red hat wearing guys walk right up to Jackie Shelton Green. And one of them leans into her and says, where are you from? And so I'm gonna read the rest of the story straight from the magazine article. Green said, Oh, I'm just a country girl. She continued sharing that one of the men responded to her, just like us. I like when good things happen to ordinary people like us. And then they wanted to take a selfie with her. She said all of them took off their red hats and encircled me to take the photo. And as the men were leaving, they all gave green hugs and told her to keep making them proud. Some folks were taken aback, unsettled even, she says. Students from historically black North Carolina AT&T State University who attended the reading, quote, dropped their jaws. And Green says she had to remind all who were present that she's the poet laureate of North Carolina, and that means that she is everyone's poet. Jesus came in order to be everyone's savior. The Gospel of John is very clear about this particular point of theology, and yet, just like in the other Gospels, we see faithful people pushing back, pushing back, pushing back on the good that he brings. And this guy, blind from birth, chapter 9 is a long chapter. It's just one roadblock after another, and the people who are putting up the roadblocks are blocking themselves out of the grace of this moment. And what's doing it is an offense to their confirmation bias because Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath. So the take-home message for you guys is more than 
look more deeply and, and pay attention more carefully. It's pay attention more to what's, what's in you. Pay more attention to the times when you go like this, because we all go like this, and it seems like more and more as the news gets worse and worse and the information gets more and more unmanageable, we have more of this. But the grace of God flows much more easily when we remove those curtains. Lake Baikal, skinny little ugly lake. Nobody's putting Lake Baikal on a magnet, I promise you. And it's the deepest lake in the world, 22% of the water that all life on this planet needs to survive. Why was I not impressed by that? Was it just because it was in Russia? Was it because I love our Great Lakes so much? Was it because the cat's butt was right here? <laughs> it's worth asking those questions in the life of faith, particularly when we're confronting something that's extremely meaningful to the life of faith, which I promise you, Lake Baikal probably isn't. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we want to be more and more your people every single day. And so we pray that you teach us, as you taught those disciples, that you take our assumptions, our preconceptions, our perceptions, and you open our eyes to what we are bringing to what we see that you open our hearts with compassion toward ourselves and you open our imaginations to try and get a glimpse of how you see things. And we pray that our seeing things as you do will help us to see people as Jesus did, as your precious children who knock around a lot in the dark, not seeing, and yet very, very much seeking you. We pray that you help us find you. Amen. And as we have been for the last few weeks, we are turning to the brief statement of faith in our Presbyterian Book of Confessions. And those of you who are looking at the trifold are probably thinking there's nothing brief about this statement. And I'm inclined to agree with you, although... This is a perceptive thing if you take a look at the Westminster Statement of Faith. It's 9,000 pages long. So, relatively speaking, it is pretty brief. We're going to be doing just, just a part of it today. And honestly, I can't remember if we're doing the Jesus part or the God the Creator part. So, this will be very exciting. The slides will let us know. Will you rise in body or in spirit? And we'll say together what it is we believe through the words of the brief Statement of Faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator, ignoring God's commandments. We violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, and nature and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation. Yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah 
chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And with that, friends, let's continue to worship God by bringing our tithes and offerings. graced us in so many different ways. And we are pleased to bring to you, uh, at, in this moment, our gifts of treasure. 
but we also offer to you, O oh God, our gifts of skill and friendliness and prayer and energy and compassion. And we pray that all of these skills together that make us up as your church, you will use through us to make the world the place you want it to be. And in Jesus' name, we pray this. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Let's pray. <clears throat> Glorious God, on this beautiful and frosty winter morning, uh, we are aware as we approach Easter that the resurrection is coming and so is spring. We pray for people in our community, in our world, for whom spring and resurrection and hope seem very, very distant indeed. For people who are living in war-torn areas, for people who are on the move, having left their homeland because it's not safe to stay, but not sure where they're going to wind up or where they'll be welcomed. We pray, O oh God, for your reminders of resurrection and rebirth. God, in your mercy. For people, oh God, who were going along just fine and then some cataclysmic weather event um, changed everything. For people who were going along just fine and some cataclysmic accident or injury or diagnosis happened. And suddenly their worlds become very complicated and very frightening. We pray, O oh God, that you will bring them the hope of resurrection and rebirth. God, in your mercy. We've got folks in our own congregation and people whom this congregation uh, love uh, who are dealing with all manner of things. Um, good things, hard things, recovery from surgery, uh, managing um, illness, taking care of relatives. We ask that you open all of our hearts to one another, that where we feel weak, frustrated, lost, you will give someone else eyes to see and a heart to reach out. And we pray, pray, O oh God, for each of us to have those eyes and that heart, God, in your mercy. And Lord, we thank you for the gathering last night of, uh, that the hospitality put, committee put together and for this, for this re, reconvening, this regathering, this rejoining that this congregation is, is doing after so, so much time being so very cautious because of COVID. We give you thanks and we ask that that continue. And we pray too, oh God, for our pastor nominating committee who are doing a lot, a lot, a lot of work, going through a lot, a lot of information right now. We pray for their energy and their inspiration and we pray too for the next pastor of this beloved community. God, in your mercy. And now, O oh God, we are bold to pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
forth, friends, with your very own eyes and your very own unique perspective on the world, very much intact, but also your hearts, your spirits open to letting in God's view. You may find that what you're seeing is what God is seeing, and you may find a shift like a crystal punch bowl held up in the light with the rainbows changing pattern and position on the wall. Now may God bless you and keep you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ shine upon you, and may the Holy Spirit give you peace. Amen. Thank you.